it's uh, the first event in a series of three. Um, we are, of course, much delighted to welcome everyone here. Um, I would like to kind of just give you a short intro on uh, on who Digital Europe is and and what lies behind this idea to really revive uh, uh, the relationship between EU and US uh, on the technology agenda. As I said, uh, Anna, uh, next slide, please. So uh, as I said, it will be uh, the first of three events. Uh, and the idea is basically to come up with very concrete suggestions, very concrete content for the dialogues and to inspire and, and, and create visions for how we can actually um, come to a, you know, a different stage on how we collaborate on tech being much more concrete uh, and also touching upon a lot of the new areas that has been emerging like artificial intelligence, uh, of course, data protection, data flows, uh, regulatory standards, but also on the investment agenda. So please uh, be aware and tag these dates uh, today, the 11th of May and the 27th of May in your calendars. Uh, and we hope to see you for these uh, great events um, in the coming period. Uh, next slide, please. If we look at who Digital Europe is, um, I'm the Director General. We represent around uh, 35,000 businesses across Europe. We have 40 associations in 35 countries and we have two chambers. So um, nearly, I would say, all the relevant uh, global players in technology, not only what you call the traditional technology providers, but also in the manufacturing sector, in the health sector. And then, of course, all our organizations representing thousands of thousands of SMEs. We aim really to create uh, new jobs, to create prosperity, and of course, to have a framework that benefits uh, prosperity, people, um, and really uh, take uh, the economy to the next level, but also our society to the next level of what technology can bring to people and to society. Next slide, please. Um, we, uh, if we look at, at, at you know, the agenda and how it shifted from five years ago, their tech was still you know, something that was kind of secondary where today we see it really at the heart of security policies, of trade, the trade agenda, uh, of domestic problems, re from reskilling, creating new jobs, um, also how we basically create growth and value in the companies uh, across the world. It is kind of the, 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 the data-driven services that really brings in the profits and in the end, the prosperity of the societies. And we need to want to bring everybody along on that journey. Of course, now we are looking at the post-COVID recovery. We have a recovery fund of 150 billion euros in Europe and 1.9 trillion in the US. Um, that uh, trade block represents the, the, the world's largest uh, trade relationship worth uh, over one trillion per year. So how do we make sure that the new value creation both brings along the domestic agenda, you know, making people um, enter the digital era with new jobs, with new skills, understanding of their digital rights uh, and, uh, and the standard that we need to apply to, and that we have a trade framework that basically uh, brings in the growth uh, to uh, both, of course, the EU and uh, and US, and we do that in a way that where we can uh, where we have a seamless uh, framework. Um, I know trade sometimes is not uh, the most uh, how can you say, say sexy agenda when we have domestic problems, but honestly, right now it's linked. Uh, to have a digital companies, you need scale. If you need scale, you also need a clear guidelines and rules across borders. And of course, uh, common data rules, common data flows to enable uh, the real value to, to flourish. Um, we stand in front of an opportunity where we can really harness the digital and data economy um, in this collaboration, uh, where we can boost the digital growth, growth through trade. And doing this, of course, uh, with setting a common framework, aligning our frameworks, 
but also bringing along the people, bringing along the citizens and making sure that our investment really benefits um, the future economy and the future jobs, but also the traditional industries that are in a huge uh, transformation. So uh, we know today that uh, that uh, ninety percent of the EU companies they transfer data outside EU, and that US is the number one destination. So we really have a lot in common. We have a lot of work to uh, catch up on because the world has not uh, been standing still for the last uh, term, and we now have a new uh, leadership in US. And uh, I really think that the Biden uh, von der Leyen era will pose huge opportunities for a new a revived EU and US tech alliance. Next slide, please. So uh, how, what is the content? We actually uh, came out with six priorities uh, way back, uh, just when the new administration stepped in, uh, which is a common a digital trade and investment agenda for economic recovery. It's a relaunch of the bilateral talks, um, it is a new framework for transatlantic data flows, uh, of course, right now disrupted, as we know, both from uh, the fall of the privacy shield, but also the interpretation of um, the, the, the SCCs uh, with the Data Protection Board. Um, it's a collaboration on multilateral frameworks, so really standing together on the international agenda and bringing, for example, data flows and digital standards to the heart of the work. And it is a collaboration on regulatory standards, export controls uh, and regulations on emerging technologies, and not least an international solution for a digital taxation. This is at least our first uh, you know, proposal on what are the things that we should be discussing. Uh, there are several others. Uh, it could be also uh, security issues and, and, uh, and not least the cybersecurity agenda. Um, this is only the start and to kick off the discussions. Next slide, please. So today we will look at three questions. So what are the top priorities for a trans and Atlantic corporation? How can we leverage industry expertise? Today we know that most of the technology innovation happens in private sector and therefore the private and public sector collaboration is much more important than ever. What are the topics uh, that should be addressed, for example, in a trade and technology council between the US and EU? And what you know, are the expected outcomes? When we stand here in five years, what is it that we would have liked to achieve? How can the EU and US show common leadership at multilateral level? These are the main three questions of today. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, with me is our distinguished panel, um, of uh, four speakers. And uh, as you see here, we have um, Bernd Lange uh, from the European Parliament. You are also the chair of the ITRA committee. We have John Neufer, Neufer I hope that I pronounced it uh, correctly, president and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, Pastora Valera, who is uh, also part of the Digital Europe uh, Board and has 25 years of experience uh, in working with regulations between EU and US, uh, working at Cisco. And of course, uh, Wolfgang Weber, who is the CEO of Zwei, representing thousands of thousands of uh, German companies in the tech sector. We will discuss the three questions at hand that I that I uh, told just before, and uh, the first uh, the first uh, questions I will jump right to uh, to uh, Bernard Lange, who is from the European uh, Parliament and also the chair of the in Inter Committee. So, um, Bernd, uh, if you uh, if you now, I mean, uh, an Inter rapporteur uh, on EU US relation, a role. Uh, that you also held through the Trump administration. How do you see the EU-US relationship is changing now with the new administration? Yeah, there is a lot of change, no doubt about. And um, as uh, Alexander mentioned just before, the view on trade policy changed. Uh, Catherine Tai uh, uh, is now in office and uh, I appreciate this very much and she mentioned recently in a speech that in the center of trade policy is now or are now workers and wages 
And I think that's the right approach. Uh, trade policy is an instrument to give benefit to the people, to the workplace, and also secure an income which is reasonable. And um, there are a lot of elements where we can find uh, some common action. Um, but of course, as Alexander also mentioned, uh, uh, not everything changed. So not everything changed, but a lot of things will be better. So we will have some trade irritants still in the air. So the question of Airbus uh, Boeing is there. And most important, uh, uh, steel tariffs uh, imposed by uh, President Trump in 2018, which will have an automatic uh, escalation step uh, beginning at the 1st of June. In our countermeasures, we have said if there is no solution until the 1st of June 2021, then we will double our retaliation measures. So there is a need to discuss this quite quickly. And uh, there are some other items like the anti-dumping tariffs on, on uh, uh, aluminium, uh, which are also uh, in the air, which uh, we should really try to solve and de-escalate. But there are a lot of issues which will be much better. Alexander mentioned the WTO. Um, I really appreciate that uh, the United States supports uh, the nomination and the appointment of the new Director General that we are now back on track discussing the reform of the multilateral trading system, that uh, we have some common points uh, on the agenda, on fisheries, on trade and health, uh, on e-commerce and digital trade, really important. And I hope that we'll get some uh, um, trade, uh, uh, negotiation documents ready for the MC12 in uh, late November this year. And of course, we have a lot of common interest in, let's say, bringing China back to the rule-based trading system on intellectual property rights, on uh, digital standards. So we, uh, I, I'm quite confident that we can have a close cooperation on that as well. So not everything will change, but a lot will be really, really better. Thank you so much. Then turning to, uh, to you, John. Uh, so you are the president of the Semiconductor uh, Association, and EU and US they have long been heavily integrated on uh, on in terms of the semiconductor industry. Which are the crucial digital transformation as a whole? I mean, will will we be even more kind of can we become even more integrated and leverage the relationship? Uh, take into account the the, the shortage of this uh, this sector. What will be the next uh, the next uh, steps? Thanks, Cecilia. This is this is a great forum, and thank thanks for for inviting me to to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> so you're right. Um, our in terms of of chips, which are foundational technology for for all of us, um, our economies are already quite deeply intertwined. Um, in fact, um, it should come as no surprise that in 2020, total two way semiconductor trade between the United States and the EU was nearly five five billion dollars so the eu and u.s semiconductor industry has industries have maintained close working relationships uh in something called the world semiconductor council where industry and government bodies co bodies come together several times a year to collaborate on policy matters related to our industry this is a rather unique forum and uh, we, we rely on it a lot, and uh, the EU and the US uh, collaborate a lot within uh, this forum. So with the global chip shortage we're currently facing, and for reasons I'll get into in a moment, uh, transatlantic co cooperation is, an, is as important as it's ever been. I think there are three areas we can focus on. One is uh, collaboration on chip supply chain resilience. Another one's export control, and another one is uh, joint R&D efforts. So on the first one, uh, resilience uh, of the global uh, semiconductor supply chain. Um, uh, clearly, as the current uh, global auto chip shortage has, has highlighted for all of us, there are multiple vulnerabilities in the global supply chain, at which put both of us at risk, the EU and the, the US. Uh, currently, 92% uh, of the world's most advanced semiconductor chips, those below 
10 nanometers. Uh, production is happening only in Taiwan, a region that's prone to natural disasters and geopolitical tensions. Also, 75% of all chips are made in China and East Asia. These vulnerabilities uh, have the potential to cause large-scale interruptions in our in our supply chains for our for our essential chips. So uh, we have an opportunity to work together through existing multilateral and plural forum, forums, such as the WSC, which I just mentioned, the WTO, the OECD, and the Vostar Agreement. Um, second, export control. Um, uh, it's important that we act in concert. Uh, multilateral export controls are absolutely essential. We're a global industry. Uh, when it comes to export control, we need global solutions for them to work. Therefore, we need to encourage uh, the US and EU to strengthen existing multilateral institutions such as the Vosnar Agreement. Frankly, where necessary, we need to come up with some plurilateral approaches to tackle this problem if we're going to have effective and narrowly focused export controls on technologies. Um, and then third, um, it's becoming increasingly expensive and complex to build the cutting edge semiconductors. R&D is critical in this sector. There's a lot of room for collaboration between the US and EU. Indeed, there's already a lot been going on. Uh, there's, there's international uh, um, research organizations such as IMEC and Belgium, the Semiconductor Research Corporation in North Carolina, and CEA Leti in, in Grenoble. So we already do a fair amount of collaboration, international co collaboration in these organizations, but we need to do more and, um, and um, a consortium based pre competitive research programs and explore opportunities for greater collaboration in this area. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, John. And I think uh, uh, what you state is just in line also with the new uh, EU investment policy uh, and uh, exactly looking at uh, and investing in this area also. Thank you so much. And then turning to you, Pastora. So um, industry has really, I think, played a big role in this period of uh, the last uh, the last uh, administration to kind of bridge the gap between EU and US. Um, looking at this new uh, trade uh, technology council, you know, what would be the areas that we should put in there, you know, in, in scope and, and what would be the role, how can we facilitate from industry point of view, uh, this new revived relationship? Yeah, thank you, Cecilia. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. And as both you and Alexandra have mentioned, I think there is a clear momentum for a renewed transatlantic relationship and particularly in the digital space. And if we think about the pandemic and how that has really accelerated the digitization of the transatlantic economy and frankly of the global economy, and that everything, healthcare, education that can be delivered digitally has been delivered digitally. And that has changed also the nature of trade. So, so I think from, from Cisco perspective and from Digital Europe perspective, as you said, Cecilia, we've been um, very supportive of finding a way to revive this dialogue and mutual cooperation on trade and technology and digital matters. Now, the Trade and Technology Council, it's an idea that we fully support, whether it's that uh, form of dialogue or we find another form of dialogue. I think the key here is to sit down and to cooperate on all of these matters. And so uh, just like maybe a few thoughts on some of the areas of cooperation, data flows, absolutely key and core. I know we're gonna have another event, uh, deep diving a bit on data flows, but I really uh, wanna highlight how critically important it is for the economic growth. Today, global data flows contribute more to global growth than global trading goods. Um, our SMEs, and I'm sure that our um, uh, speaker from the SME Association will talk about it, uh, depend on data flows to grow. And, and as industry, of course, we, we are concerned about the uncertainty created by the trends too. And we are really uh, very encouraged by the fact that, you know, the US administration and the EU are really trying to implement a new agreement um, to warranty you know, stronger privacy protection and restore certainty for business. So I'm, I'm gonna just leave it there, but I think you know, it's important in that if we, if we store this trade and technology council, this could be also an opportunity for the EU and the EU and 
the US to set a common agenda on what are the additions that we have with the rest of the world around data flows and data localization. And let me just mention, um, for example, you know, in the in the context of the um, UK uh, EU agreement, we have agreed some language there that is really, um, I think, um, uh, important around data localization. And obviously, we're quite encouraged with the adequacy decision that may, um, you know, be adopted soon. So the other area that I would say is cybersecurity, and that was already mentioned, cybersecurity standards on um, and regulatory cooperation on emerging technologies like AI or quantum computing or 5G. We know that cyber has no borders, and so we need to make sure that the cyber policies are global, are risk-based, and that we support public privacy approach. So um, in that sense, cooperation between the US and the EU to promote international standards that benef benefit a consistent approach, um, it's, it's really key. And obviously as industry, uh, we can offer a useful language that could be considered in the context of the Trade and Technology Council on, on this regulatory cooperation. The other area is the green agenda, very important, Cecilia, as you said, certainly from the EU perspective, right, this ambition in the recovery plans on fostering the between digital and green transition. And I think, again, this is an opportunity for both the US and the EU to, to cooperate. Um, there is an area that as Cisco, uh, and this is a new area, I think uh, we could have greater focus in transatlantic discussion, and this is the circular economy. So this is a suggestion uh, for the US and the EU to really rally around uh, the circular economy or, or potentially even a circular economy trade agreement. So just to conclude, I think, you know, um, if we cooperate, um, whether it's in the Trade and Technology Council on another um, uh, on another fora, I think it's important that we avoid it becoming a talking show, right? So we really focus, we are nimble, and we don't duplicate efforts um, that are happening in all the fora. But at the same time, there may be opportunities for this um, new dialogue um, to give a political impetus on issues that are, you know, what Alessandra said, trade irritants, like, like, like the digital services um, tax. So the last message from Digital Europe would be to please involve us if we set up this dialogue um, in this um, conversation as industry. We want to offer our expertise around technologies and we want to you know, support and advance and help all of these discussions on complex issues, whether it's climate, cyber, data flows or privacy. So with that, Cecilia, thank you and back to you. No, thank you so much, uh, Pastora, and uh, thank you for the very concrete suggestions. And I think you're totally right. I mean, the success will really depend on our ability to be very concrete. Like you said, there is language in the U uh, EU U UK agreement. Let's look at what it is and can it actually be a part of the solution of what we are looking for? discussions like that. Uh, turning to you, uh, Wolfgang, so uh, you are uh, the CEO of Zwei and, you know, Germany is kind of the, the the trade powerhouse, the export powerhouse of Europe. Still, we see a lot of SMEs who are struggling to really become, uh, you know, a part of this uh, global market uh, thought. We know that we have, you know, 90% of them actually transferring data but how do we get them into really uh leveraging trade across border um and and how do you think we can work together with us to to leverage uh, more smes to to uh, to trade across border yeah thanks cecilia um let me first take perhaps one point up that uh, that alexandra raised and uh, to explain where the benefits of trade are also to the broader public and i think this is really, of course, a lesson learned from TTIP and many other negotiations that we also as industry people should always talk about that. And just one figure that links also um, us with uh, John and his association, because we also uh, represent the semiconductor industry on, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, that is, um, if we had the semiconductor industry split up and each of the regions would like to be autonomous, then there would be a need for $1 trillion upfront investment to make that happen. And semiconductors would increase in their price by between 35 and 65%. And then of course, all electronic devices and that today is everything, as you know, at Digital Europe would just become more expensive. So um, now, I mean, uh, of course we, we welcome all this, what, what happens right now with the new 
uh, Biden administration and um, um, I mean, Bernd Lange and Alexandra Whitaker, I mean, it's good that you also listen to us here. And if you say you would first like to solve historical problems, then please do so and do that fast. Because of course, we as industry, we also still are negatively hit by those historic uh, trade tensions. And you mentioned Bernd, you mentioned um, the Airbus Boeing dispute. So just to give one example, this also led to tariffs on European power tools or the tariffs on steel. They also affect our companies when they produce um, equipment, digital equipment also on the US side. So there's many good reasons to be to take that opportunity as well. And Cecilia, you were asking um, specifically for SMEs. So um, in our industry, um, usually our products need to be um, need to be um, under some um, mandatory technical test in the US. And that, of course, is an additional um, threshold to enter the US market, while US companies uh, follow the same rules in Europe, which is that it's enough to have a self-assessment on the conformity with local regulations. So we would also welcome if those new negotiations help to lower the barrier to those um, test situation on the US side, it would benefit both actually also US companies, but certainly also European companies. And um, so that would be something that would specifically help SMEs because they of course have even more problems in addressing these mandatory tests than the big corporations um, have. And on the other opportunities that are there now as well, of course, on the whole new tech alliance that you make up Cecilia and Pastore. So we welcome this a lot. And uh, Pastore, you were talking about the uh, free flow of data. And of course, this is key. We are the ones that drive this whole industry 4.0 approach when we, uh, when we sh link the shop floor with the office floor. And that is something that uh, where we can really bring it together, European strengths with American, with US strengths. And that is um, would be would create value for everyone involved. And therefore, um, I think we also in Europe need to learn more that um, while maybe that most of the data are on um, US located hyperscalers, of course, we also profit a lot when these data flow back and we, when we can make use of them when we apply them in um, for to, 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 to train our KI, AI algorithms when we want to be better in predictive maintenance in our products that we then again can supply to the world. So there's much um, value in having free flow of data um, irrespective of where the data themselves are stored. Thank you so much uh, for your insight also from an industry perspective. Have you said, uh, please solve the past uh, quickly so we don't uh, disrupt the future please so uh turning back to you uh uh Bernd, and uh, if you see you know have the parliament already started reflections on what could be in scope of these uh, techno technology council discussions and, and how do you think that the parliament could play a role yeah thanks a, a lot cecilia of course uh, uh, just today a few uh Minutes ago, we had our U.S. monitoring group where we discussed exactly the question of the uh, Tech and Innovation uh, Council. And I guess uh, it's important uh, to have a uh, thought about uh, the perspective of such a council. Um, Wolfgang mentioned the TTIP negotiation, and I spend a lot of my lifetime in this TTIP negotiation uh, without any result, unfortunately. And uh, one of the major uh, obstacles in this negotiation were that we looked really on the current uh, situation of standards of certification process and so on. And these standards and certification process uh, were based on competition uh, between car industry and different kind of industries. And therefore, it was really complicated to find common uh, solutions. So I think one of the major points for such a uh, tech and innovation council for the future should be that we are 
really look to uh, uh, standards, uh, to certification for the future, for new elements. And of course, the question of data digitalization is one area where we have a lot to discuss. You mentioned the question of data flow. Of course, I'm also a friend of uh, open data flow and uh, against uh, unnecessary data localization requirements. But of course, we have the two sides of the coin inside the European Union, the protection of personal data with the uh, well-known uh, regulation, and then on the other side, the free flow. And this has to be guaranteed, and we uh, could discuss this in such a tech and innovation council as well. And then, of course, the question of uh, cybersecurity uh, and uh, uh, John mentioned export control. I would not really say export control because this is a, a quite protective uh, instrument, export control, but uh, based on a value-based um, trade policy, of course, we have to look at uh, what um, other countries, other partners will do with uh, some uh, of our uh, IT systems. So the question of dual-use control uh, is perhaps the uh, uh, one further item we can discuss inside such a tech and innovation system. Uh, council, excuse me. Um, and then, of course, the question of new necessities for uh, global regulation. And it's no doubt about that uh, the European Union is setting standards and force other countries uh, to follow this uh, because it's a big market. Uh, so look to the chemical industry, to the reach regulation. Everybody has to follow this. And also on the data, personal data protection regulation, I guess uh, this is more or less a standard worldwide. And now it's on the table, and I think Cecilia mentioned it, the artificial intelligence legislation, which was published today. And also here, uh, the question how to tackle uh, uh, the necessary regulation, this, uh, let's say, risk-based based regulation uh, to, to set the people first uh, uh, and uh, bring their interest in a transparent and uh, secure environment. Uh, this is, I think, also an element where we should and could discuss uh, with the uh, counterparts in the United States to uh, bring proper regulation on both sides of the Atlantic. So the question, what is part of intellectual property protection? Also in the frame of WTO, it is just the code or it is also the algorithm? It's an important question also for transparency for the compute, uh, consumers. Um, so uh, uh, this, I think, should be the area where we should uh, discuss and find common uh, a solution for the future. By the way, uh, the semiconductors uh, is a serious problem specifically for uh, the industry. I know the best uh, in my constituency for the car industry. Uh, we are really focusing on improving the supply for that, even with an investment in some new uh, produce, production capacities inside Europe. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Bernd. So turning to you, John, I mean, uh, looking at, you know, uh, how do you say past hiccups and uh, uh, what is it that EU and US, how can they uh, together ensure a more stable uh, trade environment on the global scale? Thanks, Cecilia. Um, just to first to clarify uh, something in response to what Bernd said. Um, I am not suggesting uh, more export controls. <laughs> I'm just saying that as export controls come, there should be better collaboration between the EU and the US. That's that's a very important clarification. And Cecilia, to your question, um, you know, I, I think we need to just get to work, start getting things done, uh, build momentum on concrete um, initiatives. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, some of the things of interest to us in the semiconductor industry are uh, focused on the WTO. We're a global industry. Uh, multilateral solutions are our are, are best friend, and the WTO has been a great um, source of free trade for us. So there's four things. One, um, 
the, the EU and the US can work together to build momentum to, it would be great to, to launch uh, an additional round of ITA expansion. So um, the ITA um, uh, fits the bill of, of, of kind of contemporary priorities very well. Um, it, it, getting accessible products, uh, tech products in the hands of consumers helps solve climate change problems. It, it helps tackle the digital divide. It helps us make more resilient, make us more resilient to future pandemics. So um, um, I, I, I think another round of ITA negotiations would be great and not just product coverage, but more participants in the ITA. A second thing, which is a bit of a bigger bite at the apple is get the get 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 uh, stronger disciplines in the in the WTO to deal with subsidies. We have a lot of subsidies problems around the world that that um, that um, uh, infringe on trade, and we made some good progress uh, in the last few years between Japan, the EU, and the U.S. in framing out what what that work might look like. We'd love for that to be taken forward. Another one um, is. <clears throat> Let's get the e-commerce negotiations completed. Uh, uh, e-commerce e e helps us bridge the, the, the uh, digital divide, and it also uh, um, helps helps the flow of, of, of free trade. So, so of free trade of, of, of uh, uh, data. So that that's the third one, and then the then the um, last one is environmental goods agreement you know that that got dropped in the last few years um made a lot of progress there were some things that stalled the negotiations they were never picked up again uh why don't we why don't we work together to get those back on track so again i think we just got to start getting back to work and maybe not taking huge bites at the apple but smaller bites at the apple to 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 build some momentum Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this insight. And, and uh, as you said, it's really getting back to work, right? And and finding out what is then inside. It, the, the subjects might be the same, but the contexts have changed, uh, amongst other with new data flows and, and other things being much more relevant on the agenda. Thank you so much, uh, John. And uh, now, if turning to you, uh, Pastora, so... Um, how can we reinforce our kind of recovery efforts on both sides and uh, contribute really to the, the digital recovery uh, on global scale? Right. Yeah, no, I think the first thing I would like to say, and we've talked about the importance of trade, focusing on people. I think when we think about recovery, it has to be inclusive recovery. And with this pandemic, the world went online overnight education, healthcare, the remote work, and, and the, the digital divide has deepened. I mean, those that didn't have connectivity were not able to continue to work or to continue to be educated. Or, and we saw it even in Europe and in the US, particularly in the rural areas. So I think, you know, this is a collective effort. This is not just government. This is also a collective effort with industry. And certainly as Cisco and as Digital Europe, we are putting a lot of effort. We feel we have a responsibility uh, to develop technologies that are helping to connect the unconnected, um, to help bring in the right skills to people, right, wherever they are in the world. And there is, you know, a lot more than we can do uh, together. And I'm actually quite excited about, you know, the opportunity with these unprecedented recovery plans that we have both in the US and the EU to really work on this inclusive recovery. Uh, the, the, the other point I wanted to make, and this is a little bit tied to a question I saw in the chat about, you know, um, how do we match the, you know, the trade initiatives with the move towards more economic nationalism? And, and I think, you know, one thing I would say is that this is really not the time where we should be erecting barriers. Absolutely not. 
I mean, this is really the time where we have to be open and we have to cooperate. And that companies that are operating on fair and market-based terms can contribute to recovery on both sides of the Atlantic. And so while we fully support, obviously, you know, digital sovereignty, strategic autonomy initiatives that are aimed to build capacity, and we think that's absolutely legitimate, I think we have to make sure that we do this hand in hand with openness and with cooperation. Now, it's not always easy to square the circle, but I'm optimistic that we can do that. Um, and so, um, you know, I think um, just a couple of examples. I mean, many of the Digital Europe companies and Cisco were already engaged um, offering ideas of transformational projects, for example, in, in Europe, right? On how can we really transform education or transform healthcare uh, in partnership with many of the European uh, companies as well. So, um, and, and, then, and then just one comment on digital sovereignty that I think is very important. I think as we look at the strategic research in emerging technologies, let's also do this in partnership, whether it's AI or quantum com computing, right? Because we're gonna be stronger if we work together. And again, rather than erecting barriers. And the final point, just a comment on international space we already the us speak with one voice the world listens right i mean the ita is a great example so again let's continue working together on many of the global pressing issues whether it's global you know wto reform whether it's potentially you know the next steps for ita or the wto e-commerce just to to name a few and and certainly as industry we we will do our part and stand ready to to cooperate yeah, thank thank you. you so much, Pastora, and thank you for also leading the attention to some of the work that we have done, very concrete work in uh, in the recovery uh, phase, uh, you know, offering both services, uh, but also really inspiring for what are the digital investments that really needs to be done uh, to recover the uh, economy on, on, on in the digital space. Um, so um, turning to you again, uh, Wolfgang, so why is uh, is digitalization and especially the manufacturing uh, industry key for a better eu us collaboration well we drive the technologies that we discussed about over the last uh, 30 45 minutes um so and i think it was just pastori talked about the post pandemic situation where on both sides of the atlantic there will be uh, major investments in the infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, that should be all investments into the right new infrastructure. So this will be a lot about, so that's how we put this, it will be a lot about electrification and uh, digitalization, because these are the key drivers to um, meet the objectives of, um, of all of us, climate protection, um, more, um, more welfare and um, circular economy, environmental protection, and so on. So um, this is driven by, in the end, by digitalized industry solutions. And the the, the huge one will be now. If you think about um, electric vehicles, the charging infrastructure that will be now rolled out um, on those on both sides. Um, again, much with with um yeah all the electricity and and semiconductors around it so um this is where um, industry plays a key role and therefore can only welcome what um, what i heard from um yeah in particular if i just may again say bernd lange from bernd and alexandra to be very open on this um and um maybe if you just allow cecilia um um on this one word on this sovereignty so this term has come up because of the real situation and developments over the last five years. We all know that. Um, maybe this is a bit the elephant in the room. Um, so it is right that um, each region looks what are the, the, the chips that we can bring in when we trade. Um, and so I think this is uh, not to the... Um, does not need to be to any uh, to the negative of, of any of us but that really helps to 
have um, specialization on different parts of the world. And I think that is, is very smart. So, um, and therefore I can also only welcome what Bernd said about the, um, the programs that uh, Europe are just um, designing also for semiconductors here. And in the end, of course, it needs to be um, one solution that um, to works together with what happens in the US uh, with the current uh, Biden programs that are being rolled out right now as well and many other parts of the world. So, but in, in the end, I think we all agree here, there's so much opportunity if we really work together. Um, we have to see in the end, you know, where final agreements can be made, but to collaborate, to exchange, um, that is, I think, what we have seen during the TTIP negotiations, what we hopefully will see again now, just learn that will, will have much benefits. So this council that, Cecilia, you talked about is, of course, would be great um, if that comes into existence. And then um, some of you talked about the smaller Apple um, bites. Um, so that is the right approach to see what we can do over the next few years. Um, and yeah, again, I think we all know this. Uh, this is for the benefit of um, yeah, all of us. Yeah, and Wolfgang, I can actually tell you that in the study that we just did uh, uh, on uh, on the data flows uh, between EU and US, we see that, of course, first the tech sector is the biggest and largest one, but actually just behind that is uh, is the manufacturing sector. So there is a large, uh, really, um, amount of data being uh, being broad across borders and and a huge need to basically uh, have a collaboration on exactly the manufacturing sector. Uh, so um, summing up, uh, Bernd, I know that you might have to leave. Uh, I'm a, a, a little bit early here. Uh, I would like to give you kind of a, a last remark before we turn to, to the closing remarks and, and uh, uh, hopefully a short remark also from Alexandra. Um, listening now to this panel, uh, you know, as a policymaker, what what do you what do you think would be the most uh, you know the next step that we should take as an industry? What would you like to see from us? I think uh, now we have uh, really a window of opportunity. Yeah? So uh, long time I, I, th I thought so uh, uh, everything is fixed. And this has changed uh, because of the Biden administration, but also because of a uh, common sense on the Green Deal. So there are a lot of opportunities. And I think uh, the industry should be open minded in organizing dialogue with the different stakeholders so that we find proper solutions for the future. And there are a lot of issues which have to be regulated and we discussed uh, some of them here. Uh, for the future and we should really find solutions that fit in the future and not uh, are totally based on the uh, past. So let's have a productive dialogue and using this window of opportunity. Maybe allow me to take uh, the last three minutes to just summarize. I think, uh, as, as Alexander just said, I mean, the policy that we make needs to serve the people that we make it for. In, uh, if we look at the, the digital economy, it has been global for many, many, many years. And if we look at the threats of that it has arrived with that cyber threats, um, threats of uh, you know, uh, technology uh, that is not safe, this is also global. And this is exactly why we like-minded would need to collaborate to find a common mindset on how to solve challenges. We totally understand as an industry, we need to solve the, the troubles of the past, but we certainly also need to shape the future for the people and the future generations. And uh, digital is not something that is arising, it's something that is here for long. And we wanna bring along the people that we make the policies for. We want to make our children digital native, digital creators, not uh, just digital users. Um, and we really want to uh, enable trade to be a part of that framework on how we do that and make sure that we have, you know, the equal benefits and the equal protections um, between EU and US.
So uh, from an industry perspective, uh, perspective, we are most delighted to have this conversation and the next two events to really find out what's on the agenda, how do we do that, and how do we bring EU and US collaboration much closer on this subject. You know, digital used to be something, you know, for secondary. Today, it is an integrated part of all economies, uh, of all sectors, and of all lives. And this is exactly why it's a, 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 not a separate subject, but something that we need to treat with the biggest respect uh, on how we, we handle policy and regulations and standards. So uh, with that, I would like to say thank you for a lot of concrete input. I encourage you also to go to, even though it's not very charming, um, we can also uh, share it in the chat, to our website. We have really made an effort to try to tab in and be a constructive partners. We have defined 30 KPIs for a stronger digital, and maybe it should be stronger digital world and not a stronger digital Europe. We have tried to make uh, suggestions on how to do a digital recovery after the COVID what should be the investments, but also how can we uh, create an even better collaboration between the EU and the US in the digital uh, era and the era of Biden and Ursula von der Leyen. So I'd like to thank the distinguished guests a lot. I think we came a long way. I think we heard a lot of concrete things. And you know, we say the devil is in the detail and the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and I think we, uh, we got that uh, right today. Thank you so much for listening in and thank you to all of the uh, of you five speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Bye. Thank you.